But uh-huh. as I've gotten older, and I now see people that I grew up with who did not modify that lifestyle, mm-hmm. some people are not recognizing. I mean, honestly, some people, I was, so, um, I went to one event and someone was like, don't you remember when we were in class together and I looked and I couldn't recognize the person. And, that, and you know how you try to play I've it off? Yeah, I've been there. Hey, what's going on? Hey. Like, what's your, you know, like like trying to get them to say their name to go back and look at the yearbook. Right. And And so what I would see were these drastic changes in people. I mean. Hey everybody, we're back again for another powerful installment of What's Killing Us. I know that title is just so exciting, but it's real. And what we've been doing is sharing information to help us take control of our health and to do it in a way that's understandable. We break it down in a simplistic way. Uh, And also we help you understand why, why it is so important for us to do it. So today I, I have the pleasure of speaking to Joy Diggs, and she's going to. She's from Dig Deep. <laughs> hey, Jay. Hey, <laughs> Thank hey, you for having me hey, on. You're you're very welcome. And you are in H Town. That's right. H Town, Houston, Texas. It's 61 degrees right now, so it's, it's lovely. Yes, yeah, nice and warm. We have a different situation here in the DMV. I think it's oh, I'm like sure. 29 or something like that right Ooh. now. Yeah, it's a little chilly. But you know, you we we've talked before and you have taken this uh this mission if you will of encouraging people to move towards good health where did that start because a lot of times you know our culture is not a culture that encourages that and then implements it so where did it start right from? yeah unfortunately most people fall into health like he's kind of like you said after things happen after there's already been like, you know, the diagnosis or, you know, some type of lifestyle change that's been forced upon them. But for me, I saw it firsthand with my grandma because um, I grew up in my grandma's house. So my parents separated when I was nine and we moved from the south side of Houston to the north side of Houston um, into the house with my grandmother. Now my grandmother was diabetic. And so at this time I'm nine, I'm in third grade and I'm seeing my grandmother like stick her finger, you know, every day to get her blood pressure. Um, before then, I hadn't really, I wasn't, I wasn't around family members who were sick, um, but living with someone who was a little bit older, you're starting to see, you know, some of those health changes. So like the diabetes, seeing her take her blood pressure every day. Um, and then you start seeing people get really sick and then passing away. Mm-hmm. So I have, you know, family members passing away with cancers. I had, you know, we have Parkinson's disease in my family, um, multiple people with diabetes. And so as I started seeing more and more sickness, I've just always been a curious person. I'm kind of like, what's going on? So started learning more about food. And thankfully, I've ta- I took some classes in school and had some assemblies in school to kind of introduce me to the concept of food being more than food, like providing nutrients for your body. And so the more I learned about that and how we can be proactive and take, take charge of our own health, I didn't want to be like the family members who are passing away. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm like, if I can change the way that I eat and be able to have like a higher quality of life and I have to stick my finger every day, And that's the life I'm trying to live. And so we talk, you know, in detail about, you know, the being a professional lab rat. I don't know how much you want me to go into it. Yeah, break down the lab rat. Let's let's, let's share with everybody. (laughs) A professional lab rat. Professional lab rat. So, I mean, as a child, I always had like little side hustles to get money. Being here in Houston, Texas, we have the largest medical center in the world. So they always are looking for people to do like research on. And when you do the research, they give you a paycheck. So some of the larger studies, they've given you $100, $200, $300. And one in particular was um, a test on what the effect of a low-fat diet on your metabolism. Now, before I did this study, just so you had a background, I'm living in my grandma's house. We're eating, you know, soul food every night, two or three plates of food for dinner. Um, For lunch, (laughs) you know, I'm doing (laughs) the fast food, the Hot Pockets, the Chick-fil-A, you know, that we had in in our cafeteria with the Fruitopia, the bag of chips. You know, so I'm not think, really 
thinking about what I'm putting into my body, even though I'm learning more about food, I'm also doing what's convenient and what was already around me. So when I did this research study, they gave me food to eat for a week. So they give you like a specific diet and you have to eat exactly what they have, you know, provided for you. And then at the end of that, you go spend the night in the hospital. They do all these tests on you. They give you your $300 check and you go on about your business. <laughs> well, in this one week when I was eating healthier, I just really felt a difference. And as I was telling you before, I don't know if it was the placebo effect of just knowing that you're doing better for your body. But after that week, like it changed my life. And I was like, I want to continue eating these same types of foods. So then I'm asking my mom, hey, can when we go to the grocery store, can we can I bring my own lunch? You know, I was bringing in like the carrot sticks with the peanut butter, you know, making my own little sandwiches and really transitioning to eating a healthier diet overall. Now, I was still eating the soul food at night because that's what was provided. But maybe I wasn't doing two plates. I was doing one plate. Right. And so it just became a progression over time where I was doing more and more to change my, my eating over time. But your point, I think, is is so key because habits form when we're young. And right. one of the things I re remember, uh, you know, being a child, of course, I had the soul food diet and, and, and everything. But uh -huh. as I've gotten older and I now see people that I grew up with who did not modify that lifestyle, mm -hmm. some people are not recognizable. I mean, honestly, some people I was so um, I went to one event. And someone was like, don't you remember when we were in class together? And I looked and I couldn't recognize the person. And, I, and you know how you try to play I've it off? There. Yeah, and, I've been there. Hey, hey what's going on? Like, <laughs> hey. Like, what's your, you know, like, like trying to get them to say their name to go back and look at the yearbook. Right. And, say, oh. <laughs> and so what I would see were these drastic changes in people. I mean, drastic. Mm -hmm. To the point where the person didn't look like themselves, but then when I when you started looking at it, you know a lot of them lived a hard life and and you know uh, had substance issues, but then when it got to the food, I went back to that like teenage went back to teenage years and I remember what were we eating, and if so if if you didn't modify that diet, mm -hmm. then a lot of people you know took a, a very unfortunate turn with it, but I see our children. You know, we kind of train our children the same way. And uh, and I remember I was doing the same thing, you know, with the, with my children. And we were taking, you know, Happy Meals. And and then it was right. around 2009. I said, we have to stop this. We can't do this. This is not this is not good. But by this time, they had already yeah. been, you know, it, it, I guess it was in their DNA or whatever. So, it, but, uh, but, it was, yeah. but it stopped. You know, it was like, we have to stop this. And, and so that's when the conversation change but I just think when when you talked about being the lab rat and that study that you went through and how you saw a change in your life and in your and the way that you felt and the impact it had on you I believe that is very very key to what we're talking about right now especially for parents watching and they're raising children and them monitoring the foods that they're putting into their children's bodies and how yeah. this could have a positive long-term effect because now you are you are coach to coaches. You are trainer's trainer. You train people on how to um, get their uh, physical fitness business going and, and, and all those different things. But that started when you had that experience. Now, okay, I know some people right now might be wondering, okay, you had that experience when you were a child. So right. did you stay on that path? Did you backslide, as they say? Did, you... <laughs> <laughs> did I backslide? Right, right, right. <laughs> I went I went full force into it. So to the point where when I got into college, you know, they used to have like the food guide pyramid. I had yes. that thing memorized. So at the end of my day, I'm like, okay, have, have I had my six to 10 servings of bread, my two to three servings of meat, two to three servings. Like I was like diligent about this is what I want to do. So much so that like in college, I didn't even drink because I was like, I just want to be healthy. I don't want to have diseases. And I mean, that's my personality too. So I'm a pretty disciplined person. But I want to, I want to go back to what you were saying about the parents and the kids because okay. um, I have a lot of clients who, you know, are coming to me to lose weight. And even though they're making changes with their food, they're still feeding their, their children the old lifestyle. So they're like, well, you know, now I have to, I have to cook two different types of meals because they're, they're, they're cooking healthy for themselves. But then they're feeding their, they're still feeding their, their kids junk. So I'm like, do you understand that you're still setting your child up to be you when they get older? And they're going to be going through the same, you know, trying to change their habits when they get to your age. So like, why not go ahead and establish that now? 
Now, I know it's going to be, you know, it's not going to be an easy road because you've already started feeding them that type of stuff. But little by little, you have to change their habits. So they're not going through the same thing when they're 40, carrying extra weight. And now they're trying to reverse their habits, but they're still feeding their children the same diet. And so that cycle kind of continues, as you were saying. Yeah, yeah, it's it's real. And, and I know a lot of parents, you know, a lot of people watching right now, you understand the struggle for yourself. But then how do you take a child who's used to extreme sugar, um, extreme whatever, um, high carb and snacks and all that kind of stuff. stuff. If they're used to that, how do you now take them? How do you transition them? Because I know one of the things that I did, I was intentional towards when I, I ran a summer camp for 12 years and towards the end, what I realized it was probably about year eight or nine. I would watch how the children, would, you know, their selections. So mm -hmm. they would always select the high sugar, you know, the junk. So I said, right. well, I have to stop bringing the junk in here. I said, because exactly. see, control the environment. Yeah, I have to stop bringing the junk. And so then you slowly watch them. They adapted to whatever was available. But then when you would look at their lunch boxes, it was the junk. It was the Lunchables. It was all the different things that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. How does or do you have like recommendations for parents who may be trying to make this transition? Obviously, they're trying to transition themselves. But anything that you might have seen or experience where they where they can do something to help their child adjust their palate because you know it's a little different because they will whine and they will complain <laughs> they will yeah i mean i think the biggest part of it is not giving into um the child's whining right because like you said it's gonna it's gonna be something that happens over time so it has to be something that you're committed to doing and uh you know over, over the span of time so yeah you may not be able to do a cold turkey. Maybe you're giving them less and less snacks. Maybe you're limiting how many snacks they can have a day or how many times in a week they can have that snack. So now the child is having to think, okay, I can only have Teddy Grahams three times a week. Is this going to be the day that I have it? And then also making them a part of the process. So like as you're choosing healthier snacks, maybe finding some recipes or maybe as you're going grocery shopping, having them help you pick stuff out because the more they feel like they're a part of it, they don't feel like it's, it's going to be as forced on them because they're part of the process. Okay. All right. Those are some good tips for parents, you know, because I, I again, I know they're going to want to make modifications as they're make mod making modifications. And the whole theme of our, the conversation and the series that we have is talking about what's killing us. And mm -hmm. this is happening worldwide. You know, wherever I go, when I'm in Africa, I see the same, I see Teddy Grahams and I see the Oreos and I see everything, you know, and it's not that you don't ever eat it ever, right. but it's like that for some people, that's their everyday diet. I mean, it's like they load up on um, different variations of the same chemical compounds. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. it might be one, it might be in this bag, and it might be packaged like this. But when you look at on a molecular level, you begin to see the same ingredients same over, and over again. And so that's like the diet. And sometimes it forms addictions. Mm -hmm. and Absolutely. Right, yeah, you, you can become addicted to different. And that's the way it was created. Like when you can create something in a lab, you can make it be whatever you want it to be. You can make it taste how you want it to taste, look how you want it to look, smell how you want it to smell. And so that's why it can be so difficult trying to eat real food. So it's, it's just like the filters on Instagram, right? Like you look at something and it's, it's like looks amazing, but it's not real. So you have so many people trying to become the thing that's fake and it's not attainable, right? It's the same thing with food. It's like real food may not taste the way that fake food tastes. That's why you have to like start decreasing how often you're having it. So that you're not used to the taste of the fake thing and you can become more more you know used to the taste of what's natural and what's real uh, uh, more good tips now let's talk about this fitness and this health because what ends up happening we go uh -huh. through that that lifestyle as teenagers early 20s in our 30s and, and so on and so forth and i think a lot of people they discover you know that the the dietary challenge Oftentimes, as they get older, their metabolism is changing. Maybe they've had a mm -hmm. child or two, or maybe they've just picked up a more sedentary lifestyle. And right. now they're having to deal with this extra weight. Mm -hmm. And this, in order to get rid of the extra weight, is either going to require, or it, it will require modifying the diet, t changing the portion sizes, and likely adding some sort of exercise component to their lives. What have you seen? Now, when did you begin, uh, when did you become a personal trainer? You said, when did I become a personal trainer? Yes, yes. So I've been a personal trainer for 14 years, which is crazy, because I just feel like, how's 14 years passed for real? <laughs> like, 
So July 2008 is when I became a trainer, um, kind of fell into it while I was in grad school to become a dietitian. Um, and the thing that I love about training is, is literally being able to change people's lives, like seeing people go from, I, I don't think I can do this to doing amazing things and making it into a lifestyle. Um, but what I find is a lot of times when people are trying to change their life, which is a big thing, right? They try to do too much too fast. And so, you know, you go from, I'm never working out to, all right, so next week I'm, I'm going to work out five days a week. I'm going to cook all my meals. I'm never going to eat any fast food. And you start doing all these things that are, are not maintainable because if they were, you would have been already been doing them, right? So what small changes can you commit to for the next four weeks? So I tell people to think about goals like, what's the most that you can do on your worst day, hmm. right? That's your baseline. Okay. A lot of times when people set goals, they're setting goals on the perfect day. The day that they set the alarm at five o'clock, they already have their, their clothes laid out. They had their eight hours of sleep the previous night. You know, the kids are, are sleeping peacefully, but that's not going to be every day. That's perfection, right? Perfection is not going to happen really, <laughs> but for a small period of time. So what can you do on a day that, you know, you wake up, you're exhausted, you want to snooze 10 times, you haven't, you know, you don't feel like cooking breakfast, whatever else, what's the smallest thing you can do? That's your baseline. So that's the thing that you can do every day. Now, whatever you do on top of that is a bonus. But every single day you can commit to that small thing. And then as the thing becomes easier, now you build on top of that. And a lot of times people don't want to, they feel like that's the, the slow way, right? Okay. But the, but the problem is you make these huge changes and then you go back to what you were doing before. You mm. gain the weight back. Now you're not working out anymore. Now you're back to the fast food. So what we have is time. Time is going to pass anyway. Right. So you have to choose, like, I'm going to be committed to this journey and I'm going to do this is a lifestyle. Right. So it's going to be a, a continual process. It's not like a destination. It's something you're always going to be working towards. With that said, and, and you've seen the journey, how do you think um, or, or do you think mental health plays a part into oh, yeah, my gosh. The, the, as, you know, the aspects of how people uh, adapt? What, what are your thoughts on that? I think everybody needs a therapist. And this is not coming from like everybody's crazy, but just life itself has a lot of moving parts, um, especially as we talk about like the, the black community in our, in our own history. Right. right. Um, a lot of times the way we were brought up is from someone else's trauma and the way they're dealing with that and putting that onto us. And that in and of itself can stop you from becoming healthier, because a lot of times people are using food as a coping mechanism for other things that they're dealing with from childhood. So until you overcome that stuff, a lot of times you're not going to be able to make maintainable changes because you're always going to be pulled back into that trauma response until you overcome it. So definitely mental health plays a big part of it. That's huge. And I think it's oftentimes overlooked because yeah. of stigma with it, you know, or we're told, hey, we didn't have those options back in the day and, you know, to go to a therapist. And we just had to tough it out without realizing that some of that toughing it out is the trauma being passed down. To the exactly. Next and so at least now we're in an era where somebody can talk to someone and, and really, you know, f you know, unpack a lot of those things. And sometimes there's a lot of layers there. I mean, that's what I realized when when I went back to one of my reunions. I said, wow, I said w when I would see and, and, and people, we all have a way of masking whatever it is mm -hmm. we're dealing with. So some people, it just shows up. Other people, they mask it through performance or whatever. Yeah, being a workaholic or whatever else. Exactly. So sometimes, yeah. sometimes somebody's success is their response to trauma. Sometimes Absolutely. Over, you know, over perform or over succeed as a response to trauma. So we celebrate it, but it's really, it could be the very thing that's pushing them, you know, mm -hmm. further. that's a whole nother conversation. But, <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. But, but what I'm seeing is that when you tie in the health, the, uh, the mental health, the physical health, all of these things make healthier people, healthier families, healthier communities. And again, it begins to address the things that are killing us. And that, so I'm glad that you did talk about the, uh, the mental health component and the- yeah, I want to add uh, one more, some, a little bit more to that. Um, sure. Cause I have a couple of clients who struggle with their weight because to get closer to their goal weight, they start to look more attractive, right? To, to themselves and to others. And um, some of them have been like abused, molested and that kind of stuff. So it takes them back to, oh, my gosh, I'm getting all this attention. Let me cope with the food the way back on. That makes me unattractive. So I don't deal with the attention. 
Yeah, but a lot of this is subconscious, right? So you don't even realize the reason why you're, you're starting to eat more food as you become more attractive and it, it starts that cycle again. So it goes back to like the therapy and being willing to block some of the stuff that's uncomfortable. Like, as you're saying, it's gonna make you a healthier overall person and how you respond to life and your, your kids and relationships and friendships. Because again, we're always being pulled back to that, that trauma that, that controls our everyday life. And so therapy is, is super important. Like I, I recommend it for all of my clients. Uh, and that, those are powerful words. Of, and again, there's some people who, who mock therapy, but in my experience and in my journey in, in dealing with people, typically the people who mock it are the ones who need it the most, you know, because, oh, I don't need that therapy. Oh, y'all talking that therapy talk. That's, and mm -hmm. then the, the issues have not been resolved or, or even addressed because that, I guess that layer or that wall has been put up in that particular area. Now, You've been a personal trainer, but you're also a trainer to trainers. And that's something because we need more people training. We need more coaches who understand much of what you're talking about. They need to be able to understand that and convey that to the people or their community. So when did you start becoming a trainer's trainer? <laughs> this year. <laughs> <laughs> it's brand new. But no, I mean, I, this year is official, but I've always helped like because I've been I've been an entrepreneur since high school. Like I. I used to sell bracelets in high school with people's names on it with different colors and stuff. Yeah, but anyway, if you're, if you're a lab rat for, yeah, you, you got the entrepreneur thing. That was going. exactly. Right. I've been, I, and I became a lab rat in college too. So See? that, that thing continued. But, um, I just, I just love helping people to do the things that they want to do. And a lot of times people have these ideas about, I want my business to grow, but I don't know how to grow it. Or they're showing up, but they're not showing up in like a big way, right? Because they, they get in their own way. So, I've always kind of helped trainers around me aspire to be more. And a lot of times the trainers, I'm going to just say they suck. Like <laughs> you, show up, it is. you show up to the job, you're, you're there when you're there. And then when you get home, you're off to the next thing. And so you're actually treating your business like it's a job and mm -hmm. it's not. And if you're in this thing to help people, you got to show up to your highest capacity so that you can help more people. And you got to approach your business like it's a business. And so that's what I try to push personal trainers into. Like, how are you planning for success? And not only that, like, how are you executing on those goals? And then how are you going to plan to be even bigger, you know, the next year? Now, I know people are wondering how they can get in contact with you. Trainers, because uh -huh. there's some trainers out there who have, they have it in them, but maybe they need that guidance as far as building their business. And they heard that what you said resonated with them and they don't want to treat it like a job. And they really want to treat it like a business and build it. And, and they have a desire to want to help the communities they can serve. You're one person, so you're not going to be able to help but so many people, um, right. you know, in, in one place. However, but there are other people that you can reach and you begin to coach them and they can help their communities. So how can uh, people reach you? Well, the best way is on is on uh, my social media. So my I have these are like two separate companies. So Dig Deep Fitness and Nutrition is my personal training brand. And that's at Dig fitness and that's dig the two g's like my last name and then my other business which i just started the dig deep trainer academy is at dig deep trainer academy got it okay yeah. and we'll make sure that all the links are in the description so everybody okay. can find you and uh, but i wanted them to hear you say it now <laughs> you know so they, so they understand because sometimes people want to get it right now while they're they're like oh i'm listening okay yeah and if you want to reach me like right now it's right. joy digs at dig deep fits.com that's my my email address got it joy yeah. digs at dig deep fit.com. Yeah. Got it. All right, cool. So now as we get ready to wrap this up, what words of encouragement would you have for people who have heard this conversation, who recognize we need to do something different, who understand that it is our responsibility to stop killing ourselves? What words of encouragement <laughs> would you have for them? Yeah. Like start now. We put off so much stuff to later because we think there's going to be like a perfect time. And so even now, like I turned 40, ago Ugh, four weeks ago okay. <laughs> if you don't lose fast after you turn 40 everything just moves. oh don't say that <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah, so i turned 40 uh, a month ago and i had some i've had classmates that reach out to me periodically since i've been back in houston like one day we're gonna do this year and so like you know when january came the same kind of few came back and were like okay you i'm ready i'm like cool let's book this appointment oh well, let me check with so-and-so all right Oh yeah, today's not, it's not—it's not, it's not going to be a good time right now. Like, when is when is the perfect time? When when is it going to be? Right? It's never going to be perfect. Life will never be perfect for an extended period of time. 
So you have to find a system that works for you with your lifestyle, with your personality, with your preferences and build on that. So again, I say stop trying to start so big. Start now with the smallest thing that you can start with and keep building on that over time and be committed to the journey because that's all life is, is, a, is. It's a progression of us trying to get better over time. And that includes your health. Oh, all right. You said it perfectly. You also have a um, on on your IG. You do like a, a fitness. You have like a 40 fit. But oh, yeah, yeah. My 40 and fit virtual boot camp. So yeah, I started. It started actually Monday, but it's not too late to join. It's a 12 week program. And I really it's a comprehensive program where you have instructors, you have a nutritionist that you work with, actually a dietitian you're working with, who's also a mindset coach. Because again, back to mental health, the biggest part of making a change is how you think about yourself, <laughs> right? Yeah. And the actions that, you, that you're trying to commit to. Um, there's also a flexibility coach, you get meal plans. So the goal is for you to take this 12 week journey with a community of people just like you, who either are turning 40 or who are in their 40s and are, and are committed to you know thriving becoming better people in this next decade of life. All right. Well, everybody, you heard it. Joy Diggs, she has dropped some gems today. And if you really hear what she's saying from her life journey, the lessons she learned as a, as a teenager, and even, and even before that, she didn't want to grow up and to be pricking her finger because of something that she could prevent. You know, we understand that there's some forms of diabetes that are not, you know, they are type one, which is completely different from type two. So she didn't want to grow up um, and do that. And she didn't want to find herself in the same health predicament that she had seen others in her family uh, endure. So the question is, for all of us, what can we do differently and where can we start today? It's not a matter, some people can do it cold turkey, but some people, they might need to now go and look in the cabinet and say, okay, what can we take out of here gradually so that we can change the health legacy for our families? A lot of times we talk about legacy, but the health legacy is something that is equally as important uh, as a financial legacy, as uh, any other kind of legacy. The health legacy is equally important. So, so Joy, I want to thank you again for oh, thank you sharing. And I, and again, everyone, please reach out to Joy. Um, Dig Deep Fitness is where you can find her, and all of her IG handles, her, her um, website, email, all of that will be in the description. But reach out to her if you have additional questions. Be sure to follow her on IG and on the social media platforms because she drops nuggets even just in some of her posts. So that way you can follow and you connect with her and uh, just learn. And that's how we begin to change our philosophy. So again, Joy, thank you for joining me today. All right, Jay, and thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. You're very well. Enjoyed it. Adventures of Darren and Destiny. And Darren and Destiny are twin brother and sister. And you go on their adventures throughout the African diaspora, meaning so African diaspora destinations, primarily focused in Africa, but we go to South America, we're gonna to go to the Caribbean. Their first book is going to take you to Ghana. And then we're gonna go on a safari. And from there, we're gonna to go to Ethiopia. And then we go to Salvador, Brazil. And what the goal is, is to be able to inspire curiosity in the continent of Africa, in our children from a very young age, and to really tell a more accurate story. Most of our children are exposed to negative images, late night infomercials about how bad things are, everybody's sick, everybody's poor, everyone's uneducated, but that's simply not true. So what Darren and Destiny and their family do is they go to different African destinations. They are learning about these different places. You're beginning to see positive images, but still telling the truth. I mean, that's the important thing, to tell the truth about some of the things that have occurred. But it's all done on our children's level so they begin to understand it. And it begins to pique their curiosity. They begin to learn more. And hopefully one day they will want to explore and visit the continent of Africa and its many countries. There's just so much that Darren and Destiny are able to do and as they're doing it, it's, it's like they begin to open the minds of a, a new generation and they don't get bombarded and indoctrinated with negativity. They're actually able to see positivity and inspiring images and messages about the African diaspora 
as well as those who are still indigenous to the continent of Africa, and they begin to learn more and, uh, and just see things differently. So I'm excited about introducing the adventures of Darren and Destiny.